behavioral symptoms in general and symptoms of physical disorders such as asthma. Uh, so let me uh, start with uh, a short presentation on uh, attention deficit disorder biological bases. Uh, I've I worked with many pharmaceutical companies in, in my career. Uh, they're listed here and I thought I should acknowledge those before presenting. Uh, the biological basis of ADHD uh, is uh, something that I would like to dis uh, discuss with respect to these uh, questions about definition and assessment, the neurochemistry and the neuroanatomy of the disorder, and possible causes of deficits that we've identified with neurochemistry and neuroanatomy, genetic and environmental causes, which will be addressed by Max and Bruce. Uh, one of the important things that uh, I think is evolving is the definition of the phenotype, the ADHD phenotype. One uh, question that will be a, a major question in the revision of DSM-4 as it goes towards DSM-5 will be whether a categorical definition or a dimensional definition might be best. This is an example with the 18 symptoms listed of a, a categorical definition where one asks whether a child is qualitatively different and has impairment associated with these symptoms, which of course you cannot read, but I hope you can read in your handout. A similar description, uh, well this is an example of one question where it is negatively stated, does a child fail to pay attention? This is a dimensional reformulation of the 18 items of ADHD and instead of asking whether a child has a problem with each symptom, one asks how a symptom is manifested in the child with respect to the whole population, not just the population with uh, impairment. So how does the child pay close attention, which might be above average or below average? Uh, this is a description in the population of what you would have from a dimensional description of ADHD a description of the child with respect to all children rather than severity of the psychopathology in those children with a categorical diagnosis. Uh, recently, a study, a twin study, uh, was published uh, in uh, Europe based on the categorical, on the left, evaluation with the Achenbach teacher behavior checklist of psychopathology. And the strengths and weaknesses of ADHD and normal behavior or the SWAN rating scale on the right, which gives a normal distribution with a dimensional assessment of ADHD. And this is particularly important because in twin studies, uh, we can look at the genetic and environmental contributions of a particular trait, in this case, ADHD. And it is uh, uh, with comparison of uh, monozygotic and dizygotic twins, one can separate the genetic variants from the environmental variants. One of the findings of this study was the heritability of ADHD was very high for both scales, but somewhat higher and somewhat with, uh, with fewer problems and, and complications with a dimensional assessment rather than a categorical assessment. Uh, the contrast effects are uh, typically how uh, parents may respond differentially to monozygotic and dizygotic twins in terms of the assessment of their behavior, which complicates the assessment itself of genetic variants. That seems to be absent in the SWAN rating scale, but present in the CBCL rating scale. So this is a, a new definition of the phenotype that might be important for genetic and environmental studies in the future. I'd like to summarize the genetic work and not talk much about it, but uh, over 10 years ago, there were two genes identified that were associated with ADHD. The dopamine transporter gene, there is a, a VNTR, a, a variable number of tandem repeats in a 10 base pair sequence that repeats either nine or 10 times. Uh, two alleles then would define the genotype of an individual and those with the 1010 genotype might be at risk for ADHD. That was discovered by Ed Cook at the University of Chicago 
way back in 1994, the dopamine receptor D4 gene, which has a VNTR and exon 3, a 48 base pair repeat sequence, and the 7 repeat allele, uh, an unusual allele with a, a, a relative frequency in the population of around 15%, uh, has been associated with attention deficit disorder. It's elevated in, term, in uh, the allele frequency in the, a sample, many samples of children with attention deficit disorder. And this was discovered by my group at UC Irvine in 1996. So this is long ago. Uh, these are 51 genes that are, have been uh, investigated since then. Uh, on the ordinate, we have a relative uh, risk, uh, and the values over one are uh, risk factors for ADHD. And I'm just showing the two, the dopamine transporter and the DRD4 genes, as discoveries more than 10 years ago. And these genes are associated with uh, uh, particular uh, systems of the brain. This is a summary of uh, the neuroanatomy of attention deficit disorder, uh, defined by uh, Mike Posner and Marcus Rakel's theory, the neuroanatomy or neuroanatomical network theory of attention. Uh, they separate the attention processes into three, alerting how much a child is ready for what might occur say in the classroom when they're not expecting anything in particular, or orienting how preparing for something in particular is accomplished by an individual, or executive control, how inhibiting impulses to wait and respond at the appropriate time uh, is uh, uh, executed in the classroom might be an example. And these are the brain regions thought to be involved with the right frontal lobe shown on the left as the center of the uh, alerting network, and the anterior cingulate gyrus on the right as the center of the executive control network. There is a summary paper of this, now outdated, but in the MIT Encyclopedia of Cognitive Sciences written by a group of us, including Mike Posner, uh, in uh, 2001. This is a summary of a decade of work by multiple individuals on the neuroanatomy of attention deficit disorder. Uh, these uh, uh, color images are superimposed upon an anatomical MRI, and the color is, uh, is related to the size of the difference between ADHD and controlled individuals in brain anatomy or brain size. And as you can see, there are several areas in the frontal uh, part, in the front region of the brain that are smaller than control individuals on the average. The caudate nucleus, the anterior prefrontal, and the cerebral dermis regions are er regions that are smaller. Color coded, you can see the yellow for the caudate nucleus, about 0.25 to 0.5 standard deviations smaller in ADHD. Uh, the prefrontal cortex, the right prefrontal cortex, about 0.5 to 0.75 across studies smaller in standard deviation units, and the cerebellar vermis uh, in brown on the right, uh, almost uh, one standard deviation smaller across multiple studies. Uh, there is a tendency for the uh, posterior region of the brain, shown here the occipital lobe, to be smaller, larger rather than smaller, so this might be a way of characterizing ADHD as a front-back problem in terms of neuroanatomy. Smaller uh, regions in the frontal cortex and larger in the back. This is a summary of the neurochemistry of the disorder that's been investigated intensively. These pathways are shown with projections from the ventral tegmentum area into the caudate nucleus and the nucleus accumbens, and then projections back from the frontal cortex into these brain regions. Uh, the neurochemistry of the disorder is, is, well, is, is better investigated with um, positron emission tomography that lets us look at particular processes at the synaptic level. Shown on the right here is a synapse, sort of the ma machinery associated with synaptic transmission of the receptor and a transporter. So the neuron uh, on the top is coming up from the uh, teg uh, ventral tegmentum perhaps into the caudate nucleus, 
Dopamine is released. Uh, one of the targets of that is a receptor, and you can see the receptor being activated in the schematic. But as dopamine's in the synapse, an active process of reuptake by the transporter occurs. So dopamine is uh, attached to the transporter and recycled, and the signal is shut off. So we've been studying these two processes, the receptor and the transporter, with positron emission tomography to see if we can determine what some synaptive, synaptic uh, mechanisms might be altered in ADHD. In both the caudate nucleus, and as I will show you today, actually the first time I presented on this, on the nucleus accumbens, this is the way we do this work. Uh, I identify the patients with ADHD in Irvine, California. Uh, Jeff Newcorn identifies uh, patients in New York City. Scott Collins identifies patients in, uh, uh, in North Carolina at Duke University. And we send all of these individuals, untreated adults with ADHD. It's important that they're untreated so we can study the disorder rather than alterations in the brain associated with the treatment of the disorder. But we evaluate ADHD untreated or stimulant naive uh, patients at Brookhaven National Laboratory. This is Dr. Volko, uh, who uh, directs this program with Joanna Fowler, uh, and an ancient PET scanner uh, in the back with a person's head inside. And, and, and we're injecting uh, here a radio ligon uh, into the person's bloodstream to detect where it goes in terms of brain uh, processes that we label uh, with different radio ligands. Here is uh, the way we do that. This is the synaptic uh, connection in the middle. And then surrounding that are different uh, images that we would get from a PET scanner. And the two on the right are the ones I'll be discussing this morning. At the top, the transporter, which is labeled by attaching a carbon 11 to one uh, uh, molecule to a tracer that is uh, sensitive and attaches to the transporter in the brain. We can use either methylphenidate, C11 uh, methylphenidate, or C11 cocaine. They both target the transporter. At the bottom, you can see C11, uh, carbon 11 can be attached to raclopride, which is uh, specific for the dopamine receptor. So those images, top and bottom on the right, are images of the transporter, and at bottom, images of the receptor. Uh, those can be turned into signals that we can graph and compare statistically. I won't go through details, but this article published uh, last month in uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA, presents a new view of ADHD based on PET imaging. And PET imaging of large sample, 50 individuals, uh, over 50 with ADHD. Prior studies with PET imaging typically had five, 10 subjects or fewer. And this allowed us to look at smaller brain regions. And in particular, we used the radio ligand uh, for the transporter and for the receptor. Here is a schematic on the right, the transporter on the left, uh, on, uh, the transporter at the top and the receptor at the bottom. Uh, again, uh, the schematic of a, a synapse. And those signals, the intensity of the color that you see there, which is proportional to the radioactivity at this, uh, in those brain regions, as the radio ligand is attaching to the transporter at the top or the receptor at the bottom, are turned into signals. And we look then at the activity here of the caudate nucleus, shown in blue, or of the nucleus accumbens, shown in pink. These are three different uh, views of the brain. What we found was very intriguing. The usual finding is that the caudate nucleus, the center of the attentional network, has lower dopaminergic activity measured by both transporter and receptor. And we did find that with a significant difference, as you can see on the top for the receptor and the bottom for the transporter. But we also found the same difference, a deficit in the nucleus accumbens, which is the center of a network associated with motivation or interest rather than attention or ability. So the accumbens, we're calling the interest center of the brain. In the caudate, we're calling 
the attention center of a network in the brain associated with ADHD. Based on this work, uh, our next phase of research is to, dis is to consider whether we should uh, relabel a component of ADHD as an interest deficit disorder rather than attention deficit disorder. And what I will do is stop now and, and turn this over to Max and to Bruce to talk about new discoveries in, in uh, genetics and new discoveries in environmental exposures that are associated with ADHD. Uh, so I've summarized two decades of work in neuropsychology. Weaknesses in alerting and executive control have been documented. Neuroanatomy, smaller sizes in a few brain regions. Neurochemistry, deficits in one particular neurotransmitter system, dopamine, and many others probably, but this is the one that has received most attention. And neurogenetics with those genes evaluated. What has happened over the last decade since the dopamine transporter and the DRD4 genes were discovered was genome-wide association studies have been performed to try to discover new genes. And what is perplexing is that nothing else has been discovered over the last decade or so of an associated gene that we didn't know about from a candidate hypothesis that has been discovered yet and associated with ADHD. Max will tell you more. He will tell you about his work with linkage analysis that has made a grand discovery of the latrophilin-3 that is associated with ADHD from uh, linkage studies rather than association studies. And Bruce will tell you about uh, some ex exposure to tobacco smoke that might actually predispose, because of exposure during fetal development, predispose the brain to develop in a way that is, then will manifest ADHD later in life in childhood. And he has an early study uh, of interaction of the dopamine transporter gene with exposure to tobacco smoke during pregnancy, the, bra the, the study here by Kahn et al. in 2003, and he'll give you an update on genetic and environmental interactions as they might contribute to attention deficit disorder.